Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of February 12th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we liked the legislative finance presentation to House Ways and Means last Wednesday on its fiscal model as far as it went, but explain why there's some missing important stuff critical to fashioning an overall fiscal plan still missing. Second, we explain why we have serious concerns that the legislature is heading in the wrong direction and indeed is starting to sound like Venezuela in dealing with Cook Inlet gas. And third, we explain why the proposal for a general obligation bond may be starting out as a good idea, but may quickly become bad. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get started this morning uh, with the discussion of Brad. Uh, we're going to start off with um, the good start in ways and means, but it needs more. That's cryptic. So tell me, tell me more, Brad. What's uh, what's going on this morning? Well, last Wednesday, uh, Ben Carpenter's Ways and Means Committee held a hearing. Uh, for the leg Alexi Painter, the legislative finance director, to present the model, the, 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 the legislative model, the LFD model, legislative finance division model, um, and give it, uh, uh, present it to Ways and Means so Ways and Means can start playing with it. It's a great model uh, as far as it goes. The model, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, you can go to the, to the hearing record on uh, on uh, Ben's hearing on on Wednesday, and see at least the the print offs of the of what the model looks like. It has various knobs uh, that enables you to reduce spending or increase revenues uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, frankly, a, a, a surprisingly uh, broad broad number of ways uh, that I think is a really good starting point uh, for a discussion. <laughs> Continuing the discussion, renewing the discussion, however you want to put it, of uh, of ways to put a balanced, comprehensive package together uh, to uh, to go forward on a on a fiscal plan. There are two things that that it doesn't have, and and they're not uh, Alexi's fault. One of them may be uh, what legislative finance division's fault, uh, but there are two things it doesn't have. One is it doesn't have any modules for oil revenues. It doesn't have any modules to show changes in oil price as, uh, as the futures market works forward. But more importantly, it doesn't have any uh, modules to show changes in oil taxes, such as reducing the per barrel credit or closing the Hillcorp $100 million loophole uh, or doing other things that would bring the oil piece of the fix uh, into the model. The reason it doesn't is because legislative fi finance has historically deferred to the Department of Revenue to provide those numbers. Department of Revenue uh, has the tax numbers, individual tax returns are uh, confidential in this state, uh, producer tax returns are confidential in this state. And so uh, revenue can take those and do aggregations that legislative finance cannot. Uh, revenue's also got the model, the revenue model, the oil model that shows uh, the different revenues at different oil prices. Um, and revenue's also got the model that would show the effect of closing 
uh, of reducing the Purbell credit or closing the, the Hillcorp loophole or a variety of other things um, that changing the, the amortization period. Right. But they didn't put any of that. They have all these tools, but they didn't include any of those in the model that you're talking about. Well, revenue has those tools, but legislative finance doesn't. So legislative right. finance, legislative finances model went as far as it could in terms of looking at various revenue measures, broad based revenue measures, but didn't have anything on oil. And as we've talked about on the show before, revenue hasn't hasn't updated its data on on the various uh, pieces or the various uh, uh, components that would result from uh, from changing oil taxes. Revenue hasn't updated theirs since before Adam Crum became commissioner. <laughs> all of a sudden, all that stuff disappeared uh, from their revenue model, and uh, and they haven't uh, they haven't put it back out there since. So, you know, it's sort of like ways and means gets you know one strong hand out of uh, out of the legislative finance division revenue model but still has one hand tied behind its back uh in dealing with uh, oil prices now maybe maybe ben has in mind uh, uh calling revenue up the department of revenue up if he doesn't have that in mind i would encourage him calling the, the department of revenue up to talk about uh, uh those things to to have to have a presentation of its oil model uh, to sort of update what uh, what uh, had happened under uh, Lucinda Mahoney's uh, uh, tenure, and and bring that into the room so we can see the oil revenue piece, and that would be that would be very useful. But that's not in the legislative finance division model, and that's a, that's a problem. Well, and part Second, of the problem. Oh, I'm just going to say before you jump into it, part of the reason why you're harping, I think, on this is because, again, that was part of the fiscal policy working group's model plan was that oil new oil revenues would have to be generated, that there is money left on the table. You and I have talked about that to the, although some people say that we don't, we've talked about that several times, that there has to, there's four or $500 million sitting on the table that could be utilized without affecting uh, oil investment and exploration investments in the future. It's there. We just need to find a way to make it all work together synergistically with everything else. Yeah, we we talked about it repeatedly, Michael. There's about five. There's about four hundred million dollars potentially in the uh, in in reducing the uh, the tax credits, the oil uh, uh, per barrel tax credits, and there's a hundred million dollars in the in the Hillcorp loophole. Not chicken feed, either one of them. And right. those would those would contribute. Those would go to reducing the burden of of on of, of other revenue sources to to balance the budget. So they're critical. Right. I just wanted to point. I just wanted to point that out because we're talking specifically about taking, you know, getting some more revenue from the oil companies in that regard. Uh, because I, you know, it's all a balanced approach. It's everything. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Number exactly two. right. Exactly right. But legislative finance didn't present any of that because it doesn't have the numbers. Revenue has the Department of Revenue has the numbers. The second thing that legislative finance could do, I think, I think they have the tools to do it. Uh, if not, I'd be happy to give them mine. Uh, but the second thing that legislative finance didn't do was a distributional analysis. The effect, the impact of various revenue it measures by income bracket. I don't know how you evaluate a revenue measure if you don't know its impact uh, by income bracket, if you don't know its impact on Alaska families and through them uh, on the overall Alaska economy. I, you're, shooting, you're shooting in the dark if you don't have that information, particularly at a time when legislators say, oh, look, you know, we've got a, we've got a declining population uh, working, working Alaska families. And we've shown we've shown on this show that 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 decline in population is going on in middle and lower income Alaska uh, families. We got a decline in working Alaska families. Um, that's a problem. We need to we need to be sensitive to that. We need to try to close that. I don't know how you do a revenue measure if you don't have an analysis that shows what the impact would be on those very families that you that you claim to be concerned about. And so, you know, a revenue measure, revenue measures that like like Alexi presented, like like Legislative Finance Division presented, that shows you the gross revenue numbers are fine as far as they go. But they're not to me, they're not helpful in the sense that I don't know if I if I toggle you know module a or toggle module b i don't know what i'm doing to the impact on alaska families i don't know where that money's coming from i don't know who's paying the money and i don't know who's getting hit by the money and i don't know the impact on the alaska overall alaska economy 
because the impact on the overall Alaska economy is coming through Alaska families. So it's, it's critical when you do any revenue measures, when you consider any revenue measures, it's critical to understand uh, where, uh, where that money's coming from. I mean, broad-based measures would, t would take a part of it from, from uh, non-residents. Uh, and that would be helpful because it reduces, by, by shifting a part of it to non-residents, you reduce the burden uh, on residents. Uh, uh, Alaskans, Alaska families would pay 10% less if we used a revenue, a broad-based revenue measure to raise the same revenue that we're doing through PFD cuts because a broad-based revenue measure would, would raise 10% of it from, from non-residents. So it's it's critical to, to understand the distributional effects of, uh, of these revenue measures. And, and Legislative Finance Division, I think, has the tools to do that and should be asked to, to incorporate those tools in the model so that at the same time you're, you're seeing the revenues you raise with various measures, you're seeing the impact on Alaska families from, uh, from, from those measures. Again, asking the question, who pays, right? I mean, that's really the, when it comes down to it, you know, who's deeply affected by that. Uh, okay, last two minutes of the segment, summate this before we jump into number two, what, uh, you know, final thoughts on this analysis at Ways and Means? Well, great step forward. Great step forward. Uh, uh, really, uh, uh, a lot of information, useful information that I'll incorporate in uh, both the both shows here, both the discussion here, as well as in the weekly column, gives me gives me information that uh, and gives Alaskans information that we haven't had about uh, about the impact of various uh, revenue measures. But we need two more things. One. We need Department of Revenue to come forward with respect to the impact of various uh, steps uh, on oil revenues. Uh, uh, the similar sort of presentation in terms of toggles. If you do this, you get this much revenue. And we need a legislative finance division or someone, uh, ITEP could do it if legislative finance can't, uh, someone to do the uh, impact, the distributional impact, the impact by uh, Alaska family brackets. I think it's a good start, Brad. I mean, you know, with you know, ways and means, uh, of course, Ben Carpenter has been working diligently for the last three years. We talked to him on Monday, uh, had him on the program for an hour on Monday, talking to him about all these bits and pieces. And uh, I mean, the good news is it looks like HDR 7 might actually get a chance to get a vote. We'll see if that helps. Um, but, you know, these are all bits and pieces. And we've talked about all this, whether it's new revenue from oil, uh, you know, cutting back on the size and scope of government, putting a spending cap in. I mean, all those things are are useful and all that we've all agreed we being collectively the the representatives of us all at the fiscal policy working group all agreed that these are things that need to be done but boy we've just got to find the political backbone in the in the legislature to uh to to be able to put all these things together because it just seems like they're all working at loggerheads right now well part of that michael i think is information um i i, I think i think we Alaska citizens and Alaska and the legislators, in fact, need more information to be able to make these decisions. They don't want the information. Maybe maybe part of the problem is they don't want the information. Uh, certainly, Department of Revenue doesn't want to have doesn't want them to have information on oil. But I think I think if we had, I mean, I publish it vir virtually every week. I publish the distributional analysis of these things virtually every week, but. But people are dismissive sometimes of that because they say, oh, that's just a, you know, that's just one person's opinion. Well, you know, if legislative finance did it um, or, or if ITEP did it uh, and presented it to the committee, uh, I think that would have a lot of power. And then you would see, as as you and I do and as the listeners do and as the readers of the of the landmine, col landmine column do every, virtually every week, you would see that the, the adverse distributional, distributional impact the loaded adverse distributional impact uh, of the fiscal measures we're using of PFD cuts and and uh, and and the things that we're using right now, you would see just like the chart we used last week that showed house finance uh, benefiting from PFD cuts, everybody else losing from PFD cuts, house finance benefiting from uh, uh, or or house finance paying more with a flat tax, everybody else paying less with a with a flat tax and by everybody else, I mean the other 80% of Alaska families, just if you would, if, if Alaskans would see that information, I think there'd be a bigger, uh, a bigger impact on them and a bigger drive toward to get, to get to a comprehensive fiscal solution, but they have to see the information. And for them to see the information, they have, the information has to be generated. 
and and the and the best place to generate it is in is in legislative committees uh and and i think ben has a great opportunity he's used that uh he's used that uh to uh uh, uh develop uh revenues that uh that uh, uh, uh that legislative finance uh, uh, talked about last week um he's used it for that for that purpose now he needs to use his committee voice i think use his committee to get revenue out talking about oil taxes the impact of oil taxes and to get uh, uh, uh somebody, legislative finance or ITEP, talking about the distributional impact of these things. Charlie asks, where can we find the slides and the tools that you're describing? Okay, so you can either just write Ben, <laughs> probably the easiest way, or you can go to Wednesday, you can go to the, uh, the le legislators web, legislature's website, go to the Wednesday, last Wednesday's hearing by House Ways and Means and look under documents and you'll find, okay. the, uh, find it there. Brad continues on to number two. Uh, Brad, uh, hit us with it here. Let's jump right in. All right. So we got to do some oil and gas basics here to, to, to talk about the Cook Inlet. Um, and, 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 I, and, I, and I don't think the legislature really comprehends a couple of basics, or if they do, they're just, they're just overlooking them. Uh, one basic is there are two components of, of gas that, you, that you're concerned about. One is reserves, and that's how big a tank you've got. Uh, and the other is deliverability, and that's how much out of the tank you can take at any given point in time. Um, and what 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 we're really what we really should be focusing on in Alaska is is a deliverability issue, getting getting gas out of the tank. How fast can we get gas out of the tank? If you can pop that chart up that uh, that I sent you earlier today, if you if you got it. Yep, I got it. There, here it comes. There you go. All right. So last Thursday, there was a hearing uh, before the Joint Resources Committee, House Resources Committee and Senate Resources Committee to focus on the coconut issue. A lot of arm waving, a lot of, oh, my God, the sky is falling stuff. Um, and uh, and really a, a big uh, a big concern about what's uh, what's going on here. And this is this chart was was used by Hillcorp uh, to help educate on the discussion. This chart shows the Hillcorp gas contracts uh, in, uh, by volume uh, and by year uh, in, the, in the green blocks. They show the Hillcorp deliverability out under those contracts or out of its reserves um, across by that green line across the top. The dotted line across the bottom shows um, uh, shows what the deliverability would be if Hillcorp didn't do any drilling. What Hillcorp was trying to emphasize with this chart was they are doing drilling and, and that's moving the curve from the deliverability curve from the dotted line up to the solid line. The gray, whenever you see an overlap with gray, uh, the gray is um, uh, where uh, Hillcorp isn't delivering enough to meet the demand. Uh, I'm sorry, the green line, the green line, the the solid green line is, yeah, Hillcorp's yeah, Hillcorp's development plan. So they're showing, and 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 the demand is the the Cook Inlet demand is sort of the 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 gray up there. They're showing the the shortfall of Hillcorp's contracts against total demand. And what that's really showing is we've got a deliverability problem that Hillcorp doesn't have enough deliverability out of its reserves. It's not really a, a long-term reserve problem. It's really a deliverability problem. What Cook at what uh, NSTAR said last week uh, during their presentation is LNG, they don't expect LNG to be able to come on by until 2030. And so there, there's really what we're really folk. What we really should be focusing on is the gap in deliverability, the inability to deliver all the reserves, all the supplies that that the Cook Inlet needs until uh, the LNG gets on. Because you know LNG is going to be expensive, but as we've talked before on the show, it's the market solution. It's what is the cheapest uh, solution in terms of in terms of cost out there. So. What the, what the legislature really should be focusing on is how do we get deliverability up 
until the LNG supplies uh, can get on. And that's not, I mean, giving royalty relief for new wells, you know, uh, giving tax relief for new wells, maybe subsidizing new wells. That's really a reserve, a long-term reserve issue. What you're trying to deal with there is a long-term reserve issue as opposed to a deliverability issue. So it's important, I think, for the legislature to focus in on, on the, the issue that they're, that they're, they're cooking and that's really facing, which is deliverability. Now, part of the deliverability issue can be set, can be solved by di drilling additional wells. NSTAR testified part of the deliverability issue can be solved by drilling additional wells in their storage unit. Their storage unit only has five wells now, I think, five uh, uh, production wells. Two of those had problems during the latest uh, peak. And, and so you've got, you know, you're down 40% uh, with, the, with those two wells down. If you had more wells in the storage field, you've got deliverability up and you can deliver more of your gas on peak. You can pour more out of that, of your tank on peak uh, than, than NSTAR was able to during this last cold snap. There are other ways to deal with deliverability. I mean, Hillcorp may be able to drill some near-term wells that would increase deliverability, but things that they were talking about in terms of subsidizing uh, new drilling by uh, either Cosmopol or by Bluecrest down at Cosmopolitan or John Hendricks's uh, 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 company up at North Fork, that is, or Kitchen Lights, that is, they're trying to deal with a reserve problem. Now, you know, some would say, well, we really, we've got a reserve problem too, because long-term we want to continue to survive on Cook Inlet gas. Well, but no one's demonstrated that's a better market opportunity for the state, for the state overall, uh, for citizens overall than, uh, uh, than, uh, uh, than, than, uh, just, uh, than LNG, putting LNG in place. And then we've got some people who say, Important. oh, we, we just need to subsidize the big gas line coming down from the top. Right. And, and that'll solve the problem. But that's right. but again, that's a more expensive solution. Right. Because from a financial aspect, the only thing that makes sense right now in the long term is LNG, because nobody else, the import of LNG to an off, from an offshore, uh, you know, for an offshore source somewhere. Right. And it's not an either or. We're not talking about either Cook Inlet supplies or LNG supplies. LNG, Cook Inlet supplies will continue to be there. Uh, and people can continue to develop uh, uh, Cook Inlet supplies if the price is right. But but developing Cook Inlet supplies at, at a huge cost, as people are talking about with, you know, uh, 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 taking away royalty and that sort of stuff, developing, developing Cook Inlet supplies at a huge cost doesn't make much sense when you compare it to LNG. Two things about the hearing last week that I thought, well, three things about the hearing last week that I thought were telling. One... We've got a regulator that's supposed to be looking out for all this. What the, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska has responsibility of supervising the utilities and making sure the utilities are able to live up to their to their obligations. If, if NSTAR is saying that they're going to go short, it ought to be the RCA that's all over them. And, and the RCA ought to be, you know, hearing uh, uh, proposals for how to how to deal with that with that shortfall and 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 moving forward on proposals for dealing with that shortfall. They weren't at the hearing at all. And, and I think that's a, a I, somebody doesn't want to hear from the regulator that has the, 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 the responsibility for dealing, dealing with this issue. Maybe the regulator doesn't want to talk, but I, I'm going to guess that somebody didn't want to hear from the regulator. The second thing that was telling was they didn't have any economists. There's been, there's been an economics group that's been hired to look at the Cook Inlet, look at the economics of the various options and bring forward what seems to be the best economic opportunities in a hearing before the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, in a hearing before the RCA. They didn't have anybody from that group uh, uh, show up at the hearing or, or invited to testify at the hearing to talk about what the various options are and what the economics are. It was like, you know, we're, 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 dead, we're, we're dead certain we're going in one direction. We don't want to hear about, uh, we don't want to hear about uh, these opportunities or these alternatives. So that was the second most telling thing. We've got econo economists who have looked at what the most efficient, the best economic results are for the Cook Inlet, uh, and they weren't asked to testify either. The third thing that was most telling was a comment that uh, John Sims made. John Sims is the president of NSTAR. John Sims made uh, at one point, 
he was talking about tax cuts for the smaller producers for uh, Bluecrest at the Cosmopolitan Field and for John Hendricks at the at the uh, Kitchen Lights uh, Field. And Sims was quoted as saying, we need to look at not what this is going to cost the state in terms of subsidies, but what it's going to save consumers. So <laughs> what we're what we're really talking about is a transfer of money from the state to, cons to South Central consumers to try to lower the cost of gas. That was the goal that Sims was talking about in that quote and the goal that others talked about. How much money will it take to, for the state to give up to lower the cost of gas to South Central consumers to a level that to a level that they find acceptable? Well, that's not that shouldn't be the goal, it's particularly in the financial condition the state's in. What should be the goal is finding what's the lowest cost overall for the state, not how much we can lower the cost of consumers by taking money out of the state. But what's the best result for the state overall? What's the lowest impact? for the state overall in terms of finding in terms of finding alternatives. That's what the economists that that have been that have been working on this and have been testifying to the regulatory commission of Alaska. That's what they've been working on to find the lowest cost overall. And I think I think it's telling both that a they weren't there uh, at the hearing. They weren't called to testify at the hearing and B Sims let the cat out of the bag when he said what you know what we're really talking about is how much can we get the state to give us to keep prices low for consumers in South Central. How much can we can we increase the deficit, if you will, the Alaska deficit, if you will, by by you know to by running money over to South Central consumers to keep the price low for them? It's sort of like Venezuela in a way. I mean, Venezuela subsidizes gasoline prices to keep the price of the cost of gasoline low for consumers. They do right. it by running huge deficits in the government. This is. This is sort of the, the Alaska version of the same thing. How much how much money does it take? How much money do we need to give from the state to keep to keep prices low, to keep gas, natural gas prices low for consumers in the Cook Inlet? Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. We're talking about the weekly top three. Um, Brad, so what, I mean, obviously having economists there to make sense, I mean, some other options should have been on the table. It seems like the die is cast on this, so, uh, you know, that they're going in a certain direction. What would your suggestions be here in the last couple minutes? Well, let the RCA handle it. I mean, in the first place, you've got, you've got a statute that sets up a regulatory commission that's supposed to have responsibility for this. It ought to be the RCA that's coming to the legislature to tell the legislature what the, what the RCA, having taken into account all the issues, having taken into account all the information, having taken into account what the economists say, it ought to be the RCA that's coming to the legislature to testify about what they think the right approach is and if they need additional legislative authority, what that legislative authority ought to be. Um, that That's sort of issue number one. Uh, issue number two is there. There is the economists ought to be there. W what this hearing was basically was, oh my God, the producers are telling us need they need help. Uh, how do we how do we use this crisis to give the producers help? How do we how do we give them more money in order to help them out? And as John Sims said, how do we give how do we give them more money so consumers in South Central Alaska get lower prices so that Alaska can be by, like Venezuela in that regard. I mean, it's, it's that's what the hearing was about. It was it was focused on producers, producers' needs, and and getting the price down to South Central consumers. It ought to be focused on getting the lowest overall economic uh, solution for uh, for Alaska overall. In the long term, uh, I mean, obviously LNG is it, it seems to be the direction that they're headed. Is there any way that you see? A feasibility of Alaskans gas filling that niche in the short, mid, or long term. Here's what here's what an economist would tell you: LNG is going to send a price signal. Bringing LNG in is going to send a price signal. The price signal is going to be the price needs to be higher uh, in order to to satisfy gas. What I'm going to be interested in is what the Cook Inlet producer's response is to that price signal. If I were a Cook Inlet producer, I'd say, well, I can't produce gas at five dollars, which is what I've been selling it to you for four dollars, what I've been selling it to you for. I can no longer, you know, justify developing gas supplies at that price range. But if LNG is going to be ten dollars, then maybe I can justify developing additional gas supplies at nine dollars, undercut, undercut LNG and still make a profit for myself. We need that free market price signal in there 
that to, to, to go to Cook Inlet producers and Cook Inlet producers say, OK, well, I've got a response to this now. I can develop additional supplies uh, at this price. What NSTAR and what the legislature is trying to do is trying to they're trying to cut that price signal and say, oh, no, we don't we don't care what the price signal is going to be. We want to keep it at five dollars. So how much in state subsidies can we pour in there uh, to keep it at uh, to keep it at five dollars? And and I think if we let the market work, LNG threatens to come in. LNG perhaps comes in for a short period of time. I think the Cook Inlet producers see a whole different price signal and see a whole different set of economics about developing additional supplies. And that's the market working. What, what Sims and others are trying to do is, is stop the market from working by saying, we're going to come in with state money and we're going to subsidize producers so they can subsidize South Central consumers. And, and so everybody will be, will be happy. We need to let the market work. We need to let LNG, that price signal from LNG come in and let the Cook Inlet producers then respond to that price signal. And I think Brian actually encapsulates some of my thoughts on this because uh, Brian rather, not Brad, but Brian encapsulates some of my thoughts on this. And he says, no, not that one. He says right here, he says, and everyone gets a little cut of that scheme. You know what I mean? The state comes in, they get, they do their subsidies, they do this, they build out the LNG and then LNG becomes, you know, but everybody's getting their taste on the way through of all that government lucre trying to make all these things happen instead of letting just the market work the way that it works. Everybody gets a taste on the way to whatever inevitable solution there is. Yeah, it's, um, uh, legislators have, he I mean, we've talked about this before on the show. Legislators have hero complexes. There's a problem. Oh my God, there's a problem. I got to step in and do it. And, and, you know, for some legislators, I listen to producers, producers say, you know, I've got a solution. Just give me money or take away costs, which is the same thing. Costs that, that are money to you, uh, take away costs and I'll provide the solution. I mean, we're, we're, as I said, we're, we're, this is the Alaska version of Venezuela. We're trying to figure out a way to subsidize somebody. So they'll subsidize somebody else and legislators will look like the heroes because they're the ones that set up the subsidy. The problem is, the problem is the state, ultimately it's permanent fund dividends to take the hit because somebody's got to make up the revenue that otherwise would have been there. You know, Tom McKay says, Tom McKay said at one point, well, you know, the, we're not giving away anything because there wouldn't otherwise be production. So it's okay if we're giving away royalty because there otherwise wouldn't be production. Well, there will be production. I mean, if LNG comes in, LNG is not the complete solution. There's going to be a need for additional Cook Inlet production. As I said, LNG is going to set a price signal that may bring additional production uh, uh, online, additional revenue online that the state would get a share of. So it's not, it's not, it's not what McKay says. It's not, you know, we're not going to get anything anyway. So let's just give it a give away the store, we are going to get something and you are giving away the store in order to subsidize the producers. So they'll subsidize the cook inlet, let the market work and, and let the market send the price signal that it's supposed to do. Let cook inlet producers respond to that. And we'll just, we'll just go forward. Stay will make money. We won't have, we won't have a Venezuela situation situation on our hands, but Brad, we need to do something. <laughs> right. We have to do something. I mean, that's the that's the push there. Um, and, and for everybody talking about coal in the chat room, because I've seen a lot of people talking about coal. Yes, we have some of the cleanest burning coal on the planet. Yes, we've got five centuries worth of supply, et cetera, et cetera. But good luck getting a new coal plant built. It would take you 20 years to get if you could even get it done, because the federal government has stated they are basically trying to. Um, they're basically trying to uh, manipulate in you into not using fossil fuels at all. That's the whole point. The, the gas is a step in that direction before they hit renewables. Uh, they are bound and determined in one way or the other to get you off of fossil fuels. So forget about coal in the, you know, in the short or medium term because they just got no interest in doing that. The federal government's made it nearly impossible to use any kind of coal generation. I mean, they're shutting down the plant in Healy. Uh, which, I mean, I, I still don't understand the long-term effects of some of the things that are going to happen there, but it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of crazy, but there you go. And of course, nobody well, wants to talk about nuclear. So, you know, what are we going to do? Well, you know, if you let the market work, maybe people would realize that, that, you know, clean coal would be a good option. If you let the market work, 
maybe people would realize that nuclear would be a good option. But but by by suppressing the market, which is what that that hearing last week was focused on doing, by suppressing the market, by by using government money to subsidize producers, so producers will subsidize consumers. Uh, uh, you're you're intervening in the market. You're interfering with the market in a way that you're never going to get true price signals out. And you're never going to get true solutions out. You're always going to once you start to subsidize like Venezuela with gas, gasoline. Once you start those subsidies, people just won't want want, want to go off of them, um, and and we'll just keep going and going and going and going down this road. You know how much more do we need to give you to how much more do we need to give you to to bribe you into producing uh, the gas that's out there. No, let the market work. Let LNG, which is the near-term solution, let it come in, let it send a price signal and let people respond to it. It will also send a price signal to the electrics. And the electrics may say, ooh, this renewable stuff, yeah, we need to get more of that because that's going to be cheaper than than uh, than the cost of, uh, of gas. Let the market work and we'll get the price signals out there and people will, people will respond correctly to the price signals as opposed to this Venezuela-like subsidy scheme that uh, that uh, the legislature seems to be focused on. Legislature quick, John Sims seems to quick, be focused on. Quick response here. Tom McKay is in the chat room, actually. He says, LNG will double, maybe even triple heating prices. Is that going to be okay for your house? Yeah, sure. I mean, if that's what the market is, if that's what the market is, it's not really going to do that, Tom. I mean, if you'd let the economists come testify, they would tell you it's not really going to do that. I mean, that's what the producers are telling you. That's what they right. want you to think. Right, right. Uh, Representative Tom McKay said earlier, I don't know if you saw this, Brad. He said, okay, we will invite Brad and the RCA to testify. To that, uh, I mean, that'd be good. I think to that you should add economists. But uh, yeah, if Tom McKay is willing to have you and the RCA in there to talk about this stuff, it's good to get the other side of the coin. I mean, you can't just have the producers in there uh, giving you all the doom and gloom that matches their, you know, matches their stuff. Having the RCA, having Brad, having economists in there, probably a good start, Brad. Yeah, sure. Bring it on. I mean, I, I, well, it'll, it'll, be a, it'll be an interesting discussion. You're absolutely right. The economists need to be there uh, as part of it, uh, as part of it as well, because the economists have taken detailed looks at this uh, and, uh, and focused on what the, what, the right, right, what the right solution is. I mean, why, why hire consultants if you're not going to use them? I mean, it's, a, it's, 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 it's sort of a, it's sort of a silly thing, right? I mean, we need consultants. We need the consultants to dig into this. Okay. We got consultants. Now they're dug into it. Now this is, now this is where it goes. Oh, well, we don't want to hear from them. We just, it's, right, it's, right, right. They've, they may tell us something we don't want to hear, but we just hired him for the, we just hired him for the lulls. We just hired him for the giggles, you know? Okay. We, we figured we, we had to check the box. Now we don't have to listen to him. We've hired him. We don't have to listen to him. So I interesting stuff. All right, let's uh, let's get to it. Uh, let's uh, jump into the final segment here, uh, number three, uh, talking about borrowing. I had a big, uh, <laughs> it's a pet peeve of mine. I had a big thing about it yesterday, but let's get Brad's take on this. So they want to borrow. They want to borrow. And what I heard uh, from, uh, I, got a, I got a text from somebody down in Juneau yesterday while we were talking about this. And they said that he's hearing on the word on the street is, is that everybody uh, is talking about this general obligation bond because some Anchorage legislators want to use it to replace Mulcahy Stadium, amongst other things. <laughs> but I mean, this is this is the whole point. They want now they want to bond. Now they want to bond for government, borrow money for capital, you know, all this other kind of stuff. Uh, Brad, give us your thoughts on this. So the core of this is, is a $200 million grant that we're getting from the federal government to beef up rail belt electricity, the rail belt grid, uh, to build additional transmission lines or to beef up the existing transmission lines we've gotten. It's a $200, $206 million grant uh, coming from the federal government for that purpose that the, the Alaska Energy Authority has gotten. And, and the question on the table is how do we uh, how do we, you know, the, the state has to has to pay a, a matching amount. How does the state come up with its matching amount for that two two hundred six million dollar grant? The Energy Authority has gone out and borrowed twenty million dollars, so we got about one hundred and eighty million dollars left. The budget isn't in really good shape to have one hundred eighty take another one hundred eighty million dollar hit. Now, I've seen some comment that we can spread that over time. 
uh, and maybe maybe we can, and maybe that lessens the hit. But it's 180 million dollars, one way or the other. So the 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 core of the discussion about the geo bond has been, let's use a geo bond to raise this other 180 million dollars, uh, and we'll and and by using a geo bond, we'll pay it off. Uh, we'll pay it off over the course of the of the of the geo bond's life, as opposed to having to come up with all the money now or come up with all the money in a fairly limited time, fairly limited number of years. At the core, that makes sense. I mean, the, the grant, we do have transmission problems in this, electric transmission problems in this state. Uh, the grant is is nice to get. It coming up with the other $200 million is, is probably the right thing to do to take advantage of uh, the grant to, to deal with the electric transmission uh, transmission problems. Um, and so at the core, you sort of you sort of begin to understand the sense around the around the geo bond. But the problem is that core quickly explodes. It quickly becomes a Christmas tree. I mean, I mean, the discussion already is, oh, my God, well, you know, if South Central is going to get or if the rail belt is going to get something like this, then 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 Southeast needs something like this. And the Bush needs something like this. And Southwest needs something. And, and it just goes on and on and on. And the Christmas tree uh, starts exploding. There was an editorial. I mean, one sense of this, there was an editorial in the Fairbanks News Miner uh, this week. Uh, that I I just I broke out laughing. The headline is it's time to reconsider the Susitna hydroelectric project. Oh yeah, let's bring that sucker back on the table uh, and um, and and talk about including that in the bond. And then some people will say, well, we're going to include Susitna, then we ought to you know talk about including costs for the Alaska gas line in the bond. And and it just it just explodes uh, into into a million pieces. So to me. <laughs> You know, if if that's the cost of pursuing of of taking this route to get the 180 million dollars necessary to offset necessary to, to match the the 200 200 million dollars coming from the feds, then uh, then that's not that's not going to be worth it. We need to be looking at other options to get the 180 million dollars. If it's constrained, if we can focus just on that 180 million dollars, then then the, then using a geo bond to raise that money may make some sense, but. But if that if that hundred eighty million dollars suddenly becomes five hundred million dollars or seven hundred fifty million dollars or a billion dollars because everybody realizes we're not going to have a capital budget again for the next twenty years and so yeah this is our one opportunity to get a capital big capital budget uh, and I can and as a legislator I can do it on my watch um, if that's the if that's the, uh, uh, the 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 solution if that's what the hundred eighty million dollars costs. Then it's not worth it. We need to be looking at uh, at other alternatives. But it was just it was just fun to see, fun in a fun in a, uh, a, a morbid way. Sense. Morbid yeah, way. Yeah. It was it was fun to see. You know this core concept. We need 180 million dollars. What's the right way to raise it? Um, and uh, all of a sudden, for that to explode, everybody going, "Ooh, that's a good idea." Yeah. Well, well I got my project here. Um, and uh, and to see that explode in, in just a very, very short period of time. It uh, Again, this is always the problem. It's always a good idea to start with, but the next thing you know, your uh, two, you know, $180 million general obligation bond all of a sudden is $800 million because everybody's added every little thing to it. I mean, and even again, credit where credit's due, even Bert Stedman said, uh, this is dangerous, you know, kind of thing. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I get worried about it when government is borrowing to uh to pay for you know to, to pay for today's stuff and we're going to borrow for 25 or 30 years on something like that that does make me a little bit nervous now infrastructure obviously super important uh you know obviously to get our transmission lines all squared away and get everything else i think that's important but the question is why aren't we eliminating other things that are nice to haves instead of must-haves to come up with that 180 million dollars why would we borrow it if we can look at things that the state's doing that it's not mandated to do by the constitution to find that money uh, to me that would make more sense than borrowing on it in a thing but the second that the second that we go forward uh and rob just said the legislature's famous for making economic decisions for political reasons that's exactly what this becomes yeah and this is not the world's best time to be borrowing the uh, i we keep track of the of the cost of treasury borrowings, U.S. Treasury borrowings, which is sort of the riskless, the riskless cost of, of borrowing, the, the 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 standard from which other borrowing is is judged is set, and and we're still above four percent on uh, on 10, 20, and thirty 
30-year U.S. Treasury bonds. So, you know, the state of Alaska would not borrow at the same, not be able to borrow at the same rate as the U.S. government. So our cost of borrowing would be higher than that. This is not a particularly great time to be out borrowing. This is one of the problems, frankly, with, with the permanent fund board's uh, uh, concept of going out to borrow money uh, uh, for additional investment. The cost of borrowing is so high, the margin between uh, uh, the cost of borrowing and and the return on equity that you might get out of that borrowing is, is very narrow. And if a couple of projects go bad, you, you, you're in the tank. Um, so it's not it's not a great time to be borrowing. And as a result of that, you want to limit your bar. If you've got to borrow, you want to limit your borrowing. This is not the time to blow up borrowing into big numbers and then have a big interest cost on top of it and then be paying that uh, as you uh, during the during the life of the of the borrowing. I mean, the Fed's the Fed is looks like it's going to take interest rates down, near term interest rates down. That helps that helps influence what long term interest rates are. It'll start bringing long term interest rates down. You know, there may be a time when it's going to be better to borrow uh, out there. So right now, if we need the stuff, there's going to be time, a better time to borrow out there. So right right now, it's better, better to uh, better to narrow the borrowing. I guess I would say, though. That right time to borrow in terms of interest costs would not be during the term of the current legislature, and so the current <laughs> legislators would not would not get credit for that better borrowing. So right, they're right, sort of, they're sort of right. indifferent to interest costs, I guess. Again, making economic decisions for political reasons. One, one more time, they can't be seen as doing something, right? Kind of thing. Uh, all right, Brad, uh, about a minute here. Final thoughts here for today. Well. Just to just to hit the three things, Ben's on the right track. That committee needs to call Department of Revenue and get them to testify on on oil revenue numbers, the toggles on oil revenue numbers. They need to look at uh, distributional analysis. Cook Inlet, we're focused on the wrong thing. We're focused on becoming how how much like Venezuela can we become? We ought to be focusing on making economically efficient decisions uh, and and setting a price signal that Cook Inlet producers, a legitimate market price signal that Cook Inlet producers can respond to. Um, and the and the and the third piece of it uh, is uh, we need to if we're going to borrow we need to keep it very compact very narrow if it becomes a Christmas tree then we need to tank the whole thing and uh, and look at another way of raising the 180 million dollars we need for the offset of the federal grant. Uh, ben Carpenter just popped into the chat. We got a lot of legislators in here today. Alaska needs to grow up. I, it starts with sustainable fiscal policy, taxing and spending that promotes economic growth. Incentives matter. We're incentivizing the wrong thing. Uh, yeah, you think? I think that that puts a point on it, doesn't it, Brad? That's pretty much it, right? It does, there. and that sort of that sort of underlines all three things today. Yes, we need to yeah. incentivizing the wrong thing. Yeah, exactly. Donna's comment. Uh, Borrowing from your children and grandchildren is even worse if it's for defined benefits for government employees. FYI, the Government Benefits Subcommittee at the House State Affairs Committee meets at 5 p.m. today. I mean, that's the other thing. We're going to borrow. Oh, we're indebting ourselves even more. Like, eyes wide open. We're, like, plunging into the vat of acid, you know, with eyes. Oh, this is going to be a great swim. Let's just jump in there with both. Oh, I just don't understand that at all. Uh, absolutely at all. And, and we're going to use PFD cuts to finance it. We're going to take money out of the pockets of the very people, uh, out of the very income brackets that we have problems with in Alaska, the working the working middle and lower income Alaska families. We're going to take more money out of them. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it, it's, we, we don't under, I don't, the legislature doesn't understand what it's doing. Um, and, and, and I understand why it doesn't understand what it's doing, but it's nonetheless not understanding what it's doing. It needs to do, needs to do the distributional analysis of the revenues so that people can see who's actually paying for this stuff. It needs to, you know, use the economists on the Cook Inlet so that people can actually see what the what the economics uh, are of the alternatives and, and you know, what we're talking about subsidizing here. Um, it's, it's, we, we, the legislature needs to, to needs to benefit from information and and Alaskans need to benefit from the information. I mean, the press doesn't report what the legislature doesn't doesn't bring up. Uh, and so the press is only reporting what the legislature does. So when the legislature narrows the focus, the press narrows the focus. <laughs> the, the press only <clears throat> the press only tells you what the what the legislature wants it to tell you. That there's no there's no questions being asked. Uh, please, sir, could I have another press release that I can paraphrase and send out uh, as a news story? Um, sorry, that's that was mean of me, but that's 
that's kind of how I feel about what's going on. All right, Brad. Well, thank you so much for coming on board uh, next week. You got a you got an inkling next week of what you're going to be digging into. Oh, it may be the cook inlet more. I mean, if, Tom, if I get to go testify at the legislature, it, it, it may be a precursor of, uh, of the testimony. But uh, um, it, it'll be it'll be something about fiscal matters and it'll be something about the cook inlet. I'm, this week's column is going to be on the cook inlet. So uh, right. We'll, right. we'll see how that comes out. Um, we really haven't we didn't haven't really dived into the uh, the whole thing on defined benefits i think we talked about it in passing but maybe we should uh, maybe we should do some analysis on that here in the future too maybe you can add that to next week's your thoughts on that and especially with comparatives to some of the other places around the country cuz it's going away and we we're so backwards in so many ways let's jump back into what everybody else is getting out of because it's got to be good you know uh, what we already got out of once and now we're going to get back into again makes no sense. It, it's one of the few times maybe in the last five years that I've agreed with Bert Stedman on something. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean yeah. Stedman said that's not what's driving. That's not what's in driving an employee retention. Uh, and it's uh, and, and there's no guarantee that uh, we're not going to get down in the hole again. So, yeah, yeah. I, we, that, it's a it's a useful thing to talk about. I'll add it to the list. There you go. All right, Brad. Well, thank you so much, my friend. Uh, we will uh, talk uh, with you uh, next week. Thank you for being here. Have fun again. Uh, thanks, Michael. And thanks for having me on. Look forward to next week. You bet. You bet. Talk to you soon. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.